Hello and welcome to the chapter 8 lecture. Chapter 8, chapters 8 and 9 are the unit on orthopedics. So orthopedics literally is a word that means the knowledge or practice of things that make children grow straight. And that would be the bones and the muscles. So collectively we refer to them as the musculoskeletal system. The bones are the skeletal system, and the muscles, which are attached to the bones, are part of the muscular system. So this chapter, we're going to be talking about the skeletal system, basically learning what bones are and naming uh, some very important ones. And then in the next chapter, we'll continue with the muscle side of things. So my term of the day in this chapter is a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta also known as brittle bone disease and it is a <clears throat> genetic disorder that's due to a malfunction in the production of collagen. Collagen is a protein that's important in all types of connective tissue, in cartilage, um, and in bo and bone. So there are different sort of levels of uh, osteogenesis imperfecta or OI. And this little video here is a, uh, a girl with OI who explains it to us, and she happens to be extra adorable. Move my face out of the way. Hello, I'm Maria, and, I, and I'm nine years old. I have osteogenesis imperfecta, also known as brittle bone disease, or for sure, OI. without breaking without them. My joints are very lax, which means I'm really bending. <laughs> I couldn't walk until I had forgot to put in my legs. 
I would break every time I stood up, but I can't walk very far because my bones get tired and hurt. That's why I have my wheelchair. I couldn't go very many places without it. It's so helpful, I didn't know what I, I would do if I didn't have it. This is my little brother Zach. He's sport and I'm almost dead. How is that right? My skeleton is different and won't grow as tall as most people. Have you been around about that? Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> Ow. Put some makeup on quickly before you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is my brother Kai. He's seven. Look how much taller he is than me already. Ah! I get tired quicker than everyone else, and I have to balance my walking out. If I go swimming in the morning, I might not be able to walk in the afternoon. It's all about balance. School, I'm in danger when it gets really busy. <laughs> I have a teaching assistant all the time to help me. Tick tock, tick tock. Sometimes he does writing for me. My hands get really tired. And I leave school at different times. I can't join in pee like everyone else, but I can try my best. I like playing badminton and golf. I love swimming because my bones don't hurt in the water. I want to be a Paralympian and win lots of gold medals. Downstairs, a bedroom downstairs, and a ramp outside. Lucky me. I have a really good team at the hospital that's looked after me since I was born. That's a long time. Thank you. I hate it when people say, What have you done? But I'd rather them say, Are you okay? Because it's not my fault that I break, it's in my bones. <laughs> I must never go horse riding on a trampoline or a bouncy castle. Gravity would squish my back down and eventually make it hard for me to breathe. Whistbone Day is May the 6th. Everyone wears yellow to help raise awareness of brittle bones. We want your money, 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 we don't need your money, money, money. I told you about my bones. Will you please share this video with other people to help raise awareness of people like me? You wear your <laughs> Alright, that's enough. <clears throat> so if you are a Grey's Anatomy fan, I won't I won't uh, provide a spoiler, but there is a case of severe osteogenesis imperfecta somewhere, a uh, very heartbreaking one somewhere in the series. Um, all right, I have another word of the day because you know I can never pick just one. And so my second word of the day is the name of a bone, a particular bone, but it's one that humans don't have. And the bone is called the baculum and it is the penis bone. So some mammals have a penis bone and some do not. And humans are in the groups of animals that do not have a bone in the penis, despite calling an erect penis a boner. There's actually no bone in there. Um, it's all due to blood and hydraulics, really. But some animals do actually have a bone in their penis and it's called the bacula. So plural, or plural is bacula, singular is baculum. And there's actually some guy in, I can't remember, Sweden, somewhere, somewhere in Europe, who converted his house into a bacula 
museum where he has a collection like of penis bones from different animals. So I'm not sure where the evolutionary branch happened um, because there are several primates that do have a penis bone, humans do not. Um, many of these animals that have penis bones are small, like mice and cats and dogs and raccoons and bats, but then bears are very large. So it's not a size thing. It's not a, doesn't seem to be like a, what would this be? Genera or, or family. Um, I, I'm not sure what, why some animals have it and some don't. I don't know where that happened in the evolution, but as a kid, one of my favorite shows <coughs> was Quantum Leap on the Sci-Fi channel, and the actor in that show, who's in other things as well, his name is Scott Bakula, and when I learned this medical term, I just couldn't help but wonder if he knows that his name actually means penis bones. All right, so now we'll get into the anatomy of the, oops, of the skeletal system. So the skeletal system is, of course, all of your bones and also some connective tissue, so things like cartilage, which is like bone but softer and more flexible, and ligaments, which are these um, filamentous tissue that helps to connect the bones together. So an adult has 206 bones in their body. When you're born, you actually have about 100 more bones than that, so babies have more bones than adults, and that is what helps them stay flexible, uh, within the uterus so they can tuck up real tight and make it through the uh, labor process without breaking any bones. And then it also helps them to grow faster. So as they grow, the bones start to fuse together and harden. So kids' bones are also softer than adult bones. Um, when children break their bones, they often don't break it cleanly all the way through. We'll talk about green stick fractures. The purpose of the skeletal system is to provide structural support, that's the main role of the bones, but also the bones are living tissue and the bone marrow contains really important cells we already talked about in hematology, that all of your blood cells come from the bone marrow, from stem cells in the bone marrow. So the bones are not just there for show, they're not just structural, they also have other really important vital functions. So the skeleton can be divided into two parts. The axial skeleton along the central axis of the body is the bones of the head and the chest and the back. And then the appendicular skeleton, appendage, your appendages are your limbs, so appendiculo means limbs. So that's going to be all the bones of your arms and legs and also of the shoulder and hip joints. So let's start with the bones of the head. So the bones in the head are, I'm going to go from back to front here. So back here we have the occipital bone, the parietal bones on the sides, the temporal bones, really over your ears, and the frontal bone here up front. So these are named after, or really the lobes of the brain are named after these bones. So they are names you should already know from uh, the nervous system chapter. In the face, um, we have some additional bones. So down here you have the bottom jaw, which is, oh, we're not on there yet. Okay, so. The face bones are on the next slide. So other bones that are in sort of part of the, the skull here are the ones sort of behind the eyes. So you have the sphenoid bone right here in purple, which actually extends through the head behind the eye sockets. And you also have the ethmoid bone right in front of that. So that sort of makes up the medial part of the eye socket. So did I get them all? Frontal, sphenol, sphenoid, the temporal bone, the occipital, parietal, and the ethmoid bone are the ones in, of the cranium of the skull that surround the brain. Now for the facial bones, we've got the nasal bones here, the top of the bridge of the nose. If somebody gets hit hard in the face and they break their nose. All right, a broken nose is broken nasal bones up here. Most of the nose is actually cartilage. So most of the stuff in the nose can't really break. The cartilage doesn't really break. 
it's these bones up here that um, can be concerning if they break because they can then block the nasal passage or if they don't if they're not straight then they heal crooked and then your nose is crooked um, all right next to that are the cheekbones here which are this is really the upper jaw um, this top part here which is the uh, maxilla and then the lower part of the jaw down here is the mandible inside the mouth if you opened up your mouth and you and you feel up the roof of your mouth so there's a bone up in the roof of your mouth and those are called the palatine bones that's known as your palate the palate of your mouth um, the cheekbones here the ones that like you put blush on if you're putting on makeup you can feel them here that is the those are the zygomatic bones here and you can see them in the sort of olive color um, and then within the eye sockets you can see some of these here's the lacrimal bone which is right on the inside of the of the eye socket and then back here you can see the ethmoid bone or sorry the ethmoid and the sphenoid bones which are part of the skull the cranium um, what did I miss oh I missed the vomer the vomer is this little bone right here in the septum of the nose which also can break in a broken nose situation. So looking at the bones of the skull, the cranium, all right, those, the occipital, the two parietal, the two temporal, and the frontal bones um, are all connected. They fuse together over time. So when a baby is born, those uh, cranial bones are actually separated and they're connected by this soft connective tissue called fontanelle. So when babies are born, they often talk about the soft spot on their head right here where there is no bone covering and is a particularly sensitive spot or dangerous spot to, you know, bang a baby on the head because uh, their brain is not very well protected in that spot. But the reason the bones are like this when the baby is born, for two reasons. One, it allows the skull to be compressed a little bit as the baby's coming through the birth canal, which is important for the mechanics of birth, childbirth. But it also allows for growth of the brain. The brain grows a bunch in the first year of life. It grows much faster than the bones could possibly grow and expand. And so this allows the bones to expand um, to meet the growing the needs of the of the growing brain, really. And so once they fuse together, those are called suture lines. And the sutures are the sagittal suture and the coronal suture, and there's other sutures, but I won't teach those in this class. But those suture names should be familiar to you because they're also planes of the body. The coronal plane and the sagittal plane are named after those suture lines where those, those bones have fused together. Um, some other bones in the head besides the cranial bones and the facial bones include the ear bones. These are called the ossicles, literally means small bones. Os or osseo or osteo are all combining forms that mean bone. And ickle is a suffix that means a small thing. Me being a Harry Potter fan, I always think of Fred and George, who were these, you know, joke, joke, jokey brothers of Ron Weasley and they used to call him Ickle Ronnykins as like a dig. So Ickle meaning little. The three bones in the ear are called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and they all have these kind of unique shapes so they have common names. The malleus looks like a hammer, the incus looks like an anvil, and the stapes looks like a stirrup shape and so they have those names. I won't quiz you on which is which but you might need to know it in another class like human bio or anatomy physiology. Fun fact for you, the smallest bone in the body is the third of these, the stapes. This was a question on Jeopardy one night when I was watching and I knew it so mark that in your memory it's a good trivia, uh, comes in handy at trivia competitions. 
Another interesting bone, one of the most interesting bones in the body is the hyoid bone. So the hyoid bone is this U-shaped bone, sometimes called horseshoe shaped, and it's on the front, um, it connects to, to the vertebrae actually through ligaments, um, but it's in the front of your neck here, and it plays a role in speech and helping to move the larynx. It's the only bod bone in the body that sort of sits on the outside of the skeleton. Um, most bones are connected, you know, in this linear fashion, like, you know, the foot bone's connected to the leg bone, the leg bone's connected to the hip bone, whatever. So this bone, the hyoid bone on the front here is sort of unique in that it's not sandwiched between other bones. It is, in fact, on sort of on the, on the surface or outside, the anterior part of the skeleton there. Um, <clears throat> So that's the hyoid bone. All right, uh, continuing down the axial skeleton, now we're in the chest. All right, is the rib cage. So the center part here is the sternum, and the sternum has three parts. So this big shaft part here is the body of the sternum, and the roundish part at the top is called the manubrium of the sternum, and this little tail, pokey tail here, is the xiphoid process. Zypho is a combining form that means sword, and it is pointy like a sword. Oid, the suffix oid, means resembling, so it re resembles a sword. Then there are the ribs. The ribs, um, there are 12 pairs of ribs, and they connect on the front, the anterior side, to some part of the sternum, and on the posterior side, they connect to the vertebrae. So the first six ribs are known, or maybe it's the first seven, the first seven ribs are known as the true ribs because they connect truly to the front and back sides. Eight, nine, and 10, these three ribs right here are called the false ribs because they technically kind of fuse with rib number seven here and don't directly fused to, they're not directly connected to the sternum, they're connected to previous ribs. And then number 11 and 12 don't actually have an anterior connection point. They are floating, so they don't complete that circle. They have ends that float, so they're called the floating ribs. Um, also part of the shoulder up here, we've got the collarbone, which is called the clavicle. My mom broke her, when, my, mom, my mom always tells me the story that when she was like a toddler, she broke her collarbone because she watched the movie Peter Pan and then thought she could fly. So she like jumped off a table and thinking happy thoughts and did not fly and landed like belly flopped basically on the floor and broke her clavicle, her collarbone. Um, moving around to the back side here, the axial skeleton in the back is the spine or the vertebrae or the backbone, all sort of vert or the vertebral column, another way that you would hear this pronounced. So the vertebral column is made up of 24 individual vertebrae plus this larger bone here called the sacrum and this little tailbone here, which is the coccyx. So the spine can be divided into five sections. So the vertebrae can be broken down into three sections. The ones in the neck, the cervical spine, cervical means neck. The ones that are behind the chest or go through the chest region, so the thoracic spine, and then the lower back spine, the lumbar spine, and the sacrum and the coccyx. So those are the five parts of the of the spine there. So the spine is, you can also see, it's made up of all of these vertebrae that are stacked upon one another. And then these white pieces here are cartilage discs that are um, sandwiched between each of those bones and sort of provide a soft padding. The bones can, because they're in this long sort of snake-like uh, pattern, they can move, so that gives you flexibility to bend and twist and do all kinds of stuff that your spine can do. But the other important job of the spine is really to support the weight of the head and neck and, and the body, really, so that we can stand upright. And the other important job of the spinal cord is to 
protect the spine. So running down the center here of the of the spinal column is the spinal cord, which is that bundle of nerves running from your brain down your back, and it is protected on all sides by this um, spinal column. So the bones of the spine, the individual ver ver vertebra, so this would be a vertebra, and plural is vertebrae, so add an E to the end for plural. So here we can see the spongy uh, tissue of the bone, and we'll see in another slide the cortical tissue of the bone. But this is called the vertebral body, and these are the, the round, dense parts that stack on one another with a piece of cartilage in between. And this hole here, or the foramen, foramen is a medical term for a hole in a bone. Not like a hole like from being like shot with a bullet through a bone, but the holes that are naturally in bones that allow for things like nerves to pass through them. So this foramen here extends all the way, all of the vertebrae have a foramen, and that's where the spinal cord fits through. And then these spiky parts are called the processes, or the processes, however you pronounce it. So the ones that stick out to the sides are the transverse processes, and the one that sticks out in back um, dorsally is the spinous process. If you sort of bend your neck and you put, you know, your finger and you rub your finger straight down your back, you'll feel these bumps, and the bumps that you're feeling are the spinal processes of the vertebral column. Um, so that is the axial skeleton of the trunk, the head and trunk. Now for the appendicular skeleton, the shoulders and arms, the hips and legs. So from the anterior side, the front, we can see the clavicle and the <clears throat> um, back side, the clavicle attaches to the acromion, which is part of this larger bone here called the scapula. You can see it better on the posterior side. It's really a posterior bone. So this ridge here is the acromion, and it is where it connects in front with the clavicle. So your shoulder right here is where those two connect. Um, your arm bone, this arm bone here is the humerus, fits into a joint, a sort of um, indentation here in the scapula. Whoops. That's called the glenoid fossa. So the glenoid fossa is like a cavity where the humerus fits, the head of the humerus fits in. Um, and that's all I needed to say about the shoulder bones. So the scapula with the acromion and the glenoid fossa and the clavicle. Now for bones of the upper arms, of the arm. So the top of the arm has one big bone in it that's called the humerus. Notice humerus is spelled U-S, not O-U-S, not a funny joke, it's not an adjective, it's a noun, so nouns end in U-S. Remember mucus and mucus from my previous, a previous chapter. So the humerus bone is in the um, uh, proximal part of the arm, and as we move distally down the arm, there are two major bones in the lower arm, that is the radius and the ulna. So the radius is on the thumb side. And my stupid mnemonic for this is, is that if you say something is rad, you might give it a thumbs up. It's rad. So the radius is on the thumb side of the arm. And then the ulna is on the pinky side of the arm. In the wrist, there are several bones that make up the wrist joint. And those are called the carpal bones. They do each have a name individually, but you don't need to know those. Just know that those are the carpal bones. And then through the palm of the hand, you have the metacarpal bones. And in the fingers, you have the phalanges. Um, so that's the arm. Now going down to the lower part of the body, the hip and the legs. So the bones of the hips. There's a large bone in the hips here. Um, that bone is called the ilium. 
I-L-I-U-M, which is different from the ileum of the intestine. So remember, I-L-E-U-M is the ileum of the intestines, the third part of the small intestine, versus the ileum of the hip, which is a bone in the hip. So the spelling there is important because that one letter differentiates two different parts of the body. Um, at the front side of the hip bone here, uh, on the anterior side, we have the, pu the pubis right here. And then although it looks like it's on the front, this is really more on the back side, these um, sort of inverse arches here. It looks kind of like a W. That is the ischium. Those are sometimes called your seat bones. So if you sit on a like chair that looks really soft, but it's actually not, and you sit a little too hard, and it hurts your butt bone, your seat bone, that's your ischium that you sat on. Or if you have like uh, somebody sitting on your lap and their butt bones are poking into your leg, it's that's the ischium that you're feeling. Um, and then you can see there's this cartilage pad here in between the pubis, the connecting the pubis there. And that joint is important in females during labor and childbirth because it can it can stretch just a little bit just enough to let the baby's head through um, <clears throat> so females actually have a wider pelvis than males do um, I already went through the spelling thing all right so now for bones of the leg the upper leg has one large bone called the femur femur is the largest bone and then in the lower leg, there's two bones. The tibia is the shin bone, and the fibula is the uh, lateral bone in the lower leg. So it's towards the outside. The tibia is the medial bone. And then the bones of the ankle, the bones, and I forgot, the kneecap here is the patella. The patella is commonly referred to as the kneecap. Um, in the foot and ankle, we have the tarsal bones. So down here, all of these bones of the ankle are the tarsal bones. The heel bone is called the calcaneus. And then you have the metatarsals that go through the ball of the foot and the phalanges, which are the toe bones. The large toe, by the way, has a medical term. It's known as the hallux. So we'll talk about some different diseases or conditions affecting the big toe, and you'll see that term hallux a lot. Other parts of the skeletal system besides the bones include joints, cartilage, and ligaments. So joints are where two bones come together. And there are three types of joints. So in other words, a more medical term for the joints are articulations. Um, so the three types of joints are suture joints, symphysis joints, and synovial joints. So sutures are the least common. Sutures are totally inflexible, very um, solid joints. It's bone fused to bone. So there's no cartilage there in between. So the classic site of suture joints are in the cranium, the skull, where the bones physically fuse together. Um, a symphysis is a slightly movable joint that contains a cartilage pad. So the pubic symphysis here is a good example. Also, each of these joints in the vertebrae are also symphyses. So it's two bones with um, a piece of cartilage in between, and it can move just a little bit. So the spine, since there's 24 of them, each of those little movements add up because it's long. <clears throat> but um, the most flexible type of joint are the synovial joints. And synovial joints have a little bit of cartilage, but they also have a fluid-filled membrane and a fluid-filled space. It allows for a lot more mobility and flexibility. So there's two types of synovial joints. There are hinge joints that bend only one way. So like your fingers can bend this way, 
but they cannot bend the other way. I can't bend them backwards and touch the back of my hands. Um, your elbows and your knees are also hinge joints. They can bend one direction. Then there are the ball and socket joints, your shoulder and your hip joints, um, which can rotate, do full rotation. And they are shaped like a ball in a socket. The humerus in the glenoid fossa and the femur, the head of the femur, femur is stuck in the acetabulum. That was uh, one I think I skipped over, so I'll just run back here real quick. This indentation where the head of the femur sticks into the hip is called the acetabulum. Um, alrighty, so ligaments are fibrous bands of tissue that connect bone to bone. So for example, in your knee, there's a lot of ligaments in the knee um, that connect the femur to the tibia and the fibula and the patella. Cartilage is a flexible tissue that can act as a padding between bones. It can also serve as structural material in an area where there isn't bones, like in your ears and in your nose. So it's more flexible, as you can tell with your ears and your nose, because you can fold them and bend them and they don't break. So a little bit of the physiology of bones uh, or the physical makeup of the bones. Bones are made of osseous tissue, osseo meaning bone, um, and there's the thick, sort of this thick outer part of the bone is called the cortical or compact bone, and it's very dense. And the ends of the bones you can see have all these little air pockets. We call this the spongy or cancellous bone. And the reason that the bone is spongy in that area is really it's um, that uh, those air bubbles make the bones lighter, which just makes for better mechanics of our bodies. If we're too heavy, it's too, too much to carry around a heavy skeleton. So it's a way to lighten the load of the bones, um, but also keep them strong. So they're not totally hollow. They have these branching scaffoldings that keep them strong. We'll talk about the condition osteoporosis, which is basically a breakdown of this spongy tissue. Um, you can see in the large bones, there are growth plates at the ends of the bones. The ends of the bones, by the way, are called the epiphyses. So the epiphysis is the knotty looking end, and then the shaft of the bone is the diaphysis. Um, and these epiphyseal plates are the growth plates. That's where new bone comes from. Inside the bone is bone marrow. So in the diaphysis, you have the yellow marrow, which contains a lot of vitamin and fat storage. And in the red marrow, in the spongy tissue, is where the stem cells for the blood are, um, the hematopoietic stem cells. And bones, we typically think of bones like from skeletons, which are, those are dead bones. Those are not living bones. What's left in a skeleton is just the, the hardened calcium phosphate uh, shell of the bone. But a living bone in a living person is highly innervated and vascularized. There's a soft layer of tissue around the outside of the bone called the periosteum. If you are a beach fan, and you've ever seen a sand dollar, I feel like that's a good example of like bones. So sand dollars, if you find like a dead dried out one, it's just this white piece, just like porcelain white shell kind of a thing. But if you find a living sand dollar, it's actually covered in like this furry material and it's very much alive. So a living bone is not quite furry, but it is very much alive. Um, it's not this like an inanimate part of the body, like your nails or your hair. Um, bones have nerves and they get blood flow and there's a lot of life coming from the bones and going to the bones. So the bones do become harder with age 
we said that as the baby's bones grow, they harden and they fuse together. And that hardening process is called ossification. Again, os osseo being a combining form for bone. Um, and although our bones do most of their growing during childhood and adolescence, and we don't grow a lot after that throughout adulthood, it doesn't mean that our bones just stay completely static. So I like to think of it as sort of like building a house. You know, it takes a while to build a house. There's lots of parts to put together. But once the house is built, that doesn't mean that you no longer have to maintain it. So um, when you are growing your bones, that's sort of like the building of the house. That's a, There's a lot of work put into that. But once the house is built, you still need to, you know, replace the roof and renovate the bathroom. And, you know, every 10 years or so, you got more work to do. Um, so same thing with our bones. They are the structural part of our bodies and we do need to parent, you know, occasionally replace damaged bone and repair damaged bone, not just broken bones, but as our bones get old, the cells age and they need to, um, be restored. And so there are cells in our bones that do this. So, uh, they sort of maintain the bones during the adult years. About 10% of your skeleton is actually broken down and rebuilt every year during adulthood. Um, the, the ones that do the breaking down are called the osteoclasts. They chew up old bone tissue that's tired and weak. And the osteoblasts deposit new bone cells and do the repair. As we age, the osteoclasts are still pretty good at their job, but the osteoblasts sort of slow down and can't quite keep up. So we have more damaged areas being removed than we have osteoblasts depositing new tissue. And that's why bone density decreases as we age, usually about after the age of 40. So that's the anatomy and physiology of the bones that you need to know. It's a limited list. It's definitely not all 206 bones in the body, but just the major ones for this class. Now for some diseases and conditions of the bones and cartilage. Avascular necrosis. So this means death, necrosis, death of tissue. Avascular, without blood vessels. All right, so in this case, this is a lack of blood supply to a bone. If the blood supply to a bone gets cut off, then the bone itself will start to die. And this is actually what happened if you ever watched the show House. Dr. House, he has a limp um, in his leg because he suffered from avascular necrosis. They almost had to amputate his leg. They didn't, but... That's where the damage came from. Um, osteosarcoma is a tumor in the bone. It's a bone tumor. Sarcomas are usually cancerous. So an osteosarcoma would be a cancerous bone tumor. Chondromalacia patelli. Patelli means the uh, kneecaps. Chondro is a combining form for cartilage. And malacia is a suffix that means a condition of softening. So it's a condition of softening of the cartilage in the kneecap, which can lead to pain in the knees. Um, osteomalacia is a condition of softening of the bones, and this can happen if you're not getting enough nutrients that are important for building bones. Um, calcium and vitamin D uh, are really important for forming that hard, for ossification of the bones and so they don't become properly ossified and that's reversible osteomalacia is reversible simply by replacing those things in your diet you can re strengthen the bones unlike osteoporosis so osteoporosis is specifically a breakdown of that spongy cancellous tissue so this would be normal spongy tissue with a normal amount of holes in it but when it breaks down and you get more hole and more air pockets, it weakens that spongy bone, makes it more prone to fracturing. 
and that's osteoporosis, a condition of, of excessive pores or holes in the bones. Um, osteomyelitis is an infection. Myelo can mean myelin sheaths of the nerves, but it also means bone marrow. So osteomyelitis would be an infection in the bone, um, in the bone marrow itself. So when I was in college, here's my story about osteomyelitis. Um, my friends and I were on spring break and one of my friends, we were at a beach, a beach house, and one of my friends was carrying a beach chair out to the beach through the sand and stepped on a roofing tack, like basically like a really large thumb tack that was in the sand. And it went into his heel and we ended up taking him to like an urgent care to have it removed. And the doctor there put him on antibiotics after he removed it because he couldn't tell whether the tack actually punctured the bone or not. And he was worried about him developing osteomyelitis if that tack had punctured the bone, um, that he could end up with a bone infection. So he went ahead and put him on antibiotics to, to try to prevent it as a prophylaxis, if you will. So a very, very common set of injuries in the skeletal system would be bone breaks or fractures. The medical term for a bone break is a fracture. A closed fracture is one where the bone breaks inside the skin and you can you might be able to see a little bit of disfigurement like a kink in the arm, but you can't actually see bone poking out. An open fracture, also called a compound fracture, is when the bone breaks through the skin. So those are pretty obvious bone breaks, like um, those are very bad bone breaks. And uh, an open fracture is always by definition a displaced fracture. So a displaced fracture is one where the bones are not lined up properly. So they are broken and also like out of place. A non-displaced fracture is when the bone breaks but everything's already sort of properly lined up, so all you need to do is immobilize the bone and let it heal. Um, so a displaced fracture will need to be set um, in order to heal properly, so the doctors will need to realign it. Um, a closed fracture could be non-displaced, or displaced. An open fracture, if the bone's poking out of the skin, then by definition it's displaced, it's not in the proper position. Um, a specific fracture of the wrist here, of the radius, the distal radius, is called a collies fracture, and this is an injury that can occur if you fall and you catch yourself, you fall on your hand, all right, the, the shock or the pressure can break this bone here, and this can be used in forensics sometimes to determine how somebody injured themselves. Um, it can be a sign of abuse if somebody comes in and um, has a collie's fracture and says they like, you know, bumped into something that if their story of how they got injured doesn't fit with the mechanics of the injury, it you know suggests there's some covering up of the truth, which may indicate abuse. Um, a comminuted fracture, comminuted means shattered, crushed into several pieces. Uh, I have a friend who got a comminuted fracture of her ilium, of her hip bone. She was snowboarding and she snowboarded into the woods and ended up crashing into a tree with her hip and it shattered her hip bone into pieces. So it was a comminuted fracture. Another type of shattering fracture is a compression fracture. And this happens in the spine if you fall really hard on your butt. Um, so uh, I had a student one year who her boyfriend ended up getting a, a couple of compression fractures in his spine while he was snowmobiling. He was snowmobiling and he was going around a curve and he took it too fast and there was sort of like a cliff there and he ended up going over the edge of that cliff and falling like really hard on the seat of his uh, snowmobile and ended up with a couple of compression fractures of the spine. So usually these just require rest in order to heal. 
but they can lead to sort of long-term back pain issues. Um, a depressed fracture, like if you got hit in the skull and the, and the fragments like went down, all right, that is a depressed fracture. A green stick fracture is one that you see in children's bones. So children's bones are still not fully ossified. And so sometimes they break not cleanly all the way through, kind of like a green stick. So if you've ever been hunting for marshmallow sticks and you're in the woods, you always want to look for ones that are dead on the ground. If you try to pull one off of a tree, even if the tree looks dead, sometimes you'll try to break it off and you'll find it won't come off because on the inside of the stick, although the outside looks dead and brown, the inside is still green and living. And that green part is very flexible and it doesn't break cleanly. Um, and so that's why it's called a green stick fracture because it's like trying to break a green stick. It's flexible on the inside so it doesn't break cleanly all the way through. A hairline fracture is a break in the outer part of the bone that, but the bone doesn't completely break through. So for me, I think of, I have a lot of dishes that I would say had hairline fractures. They have a crack in them, but they're not broken. They're still sealed. So again, hairline fractures would just require rest. You don't need to reset them, um, but they will be painful and they will require rest so that they don't become full fractures. An oblique Fracture, spiral fracture, and transverse fractures are just indicators of sort of the direction of the break, so the angle of that broken bone. Um, a spiral fracture usually happens from a rotation injury. This can this is common in skiers who break their legs because you know they fall in their ski and they twist and roll down the hill and their ski gets kind of stuck and they twist around the ski. They twist their leg. And so that can be a cause spiral fracture. Um, some other disease, disease of the vertebrae, where the vertebrae is not quite straight. Um, ankylosing spondylitis is actually a autoimmune condition that causes inflammation of the spine. Spondylo means spine and causes it to become crooked. Kyphosis is the medical term for hunchback. So this is an excessive um posterior curvature of the cervical spine so it, it has excessive posterior curve lordosis is an excessive um, anterior curvature of the lumbar spine so the lower spine if it is excessively curved here so the spine is normally a little bit s-shaped it does have some normal curvature but excessive curvature results in either kyphosis or lordosis, lordosis in the lower back, sometimes called sway back. Um, scoliosis is a left to right crookedness of the spine. So the spine normally is very straight. If we're looking from posterior, it goes straight down um, the center of the back, but if it's curved, there's curvature to that, that's scoliosis. This is a particularly severe case of scoliosis here. And spondylolisthesis, listhesis means a slipping of the spine. So this picture here is looking at spondylolis, spondylolisthesis. So here is the sacrum, oops, and then here's the lumbar spine. And so you can see the lumbar spine is sort of slipping off the front of the sacrum. It should be shifted back a little bit and really positioned sort of right here um, instead of slipping off the front of the sacrum. This is different than a slipped disc. A slipped disc is when one of those cartilage pads is slipping out and is pressing against the nerves and causing nerve pain. That's different than a slipped spine that's spondylolisthesis. Um, conditions of the joints. Arthralgia is joint pain. Arthritis is joint inflammation. They usually go hand in hand. Arthritis is usually painful, causes arthralgia, but not. they don't always go hand in hand. 
Um, osteoarthritis would be inflammation of both the joint and the bone in that joint. So you can see that in this image here. Um, arthropathy is just a general term for any disease of the joint. So all of these would be different types of arthropathies. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition that causes excessive inflammation of the joints um, versus something like osteoarthritis, which can be caused by uh, just uh, excessive mechanical use. So physical chafing of the joints, not due to the immune system. Heme arthrosis is heme, hemato is blood. So that would be a condition of blood in the joints some conditions of specific joints, your knees and your feet. So uh, you can be born with these, some of these are congenital conditions, some of them you can develop. Genu valgum and genu verum refer to uh, bent knees. So if you are knock kneed, so your knees bend in and sort of kiss each other, that's called genu valgum. People who are bow-legged and their uh, legs bow outwards, kind of like somebody who rides a horse a lot, um, is called genu verum. And that bow-leggedness was a common sign of a disease called rickets, which was a nutritional deficiency that was um, common in the 1800s and early 1900s before they knew about vitamin D. Um, and it would often result in soft bone development and so kids as they grew their their bones in their legs didn't develop hard enough and so the weight of their upper body call, caused the legs to bow and so a sign of rickets is that bow-legged look um hallux valgus is the medical term for a bunion bunion is sort of an overdeveloped inflammation of the of the joint of the big toe the hallux and then talipes equinovarus is the medical term for club foot. And this is um, babies when they're born, sometimes their feet are turned in from their positioning in utero. And it's normal for their feet to have a little bit of a turn in, but if that turn in is very severe, then it's due to improper positioning of the bones. And what they actually have to do is they basically just break the ankle bones here and and set the feet in cast so that they can heal straight. Um, some medical and diagnostic procedures. An arthrography is a recording of a joint. Goniometry, I think I have an extra I in here. I think it's just goniometry, not goniometry, is what's being pictured here. So it's using a tool, a mathematical tool to measure the angle of the mobility of a joint. So if you hurt your shoulder, for example, and you could only lift your arm this high versus after physical therapy, you could lift your arm this high, um, the goniometry measures the angle of that joint. So it helps to uh, measure improvement of mobility. Um, some different surgical procedures, an arthrocentesis, a centesis is a procedure to puncture, usually to withdraw fluid. So think of the synovial joints, which are full of fluid. If they become inflamed, you may need to remove some of that fluid. That would be an arthrocentesis. An arthroscopy is a procedure to go in and look at the joint with a camera. Arthroscopic surgeries are ones where they make several small incisions and they can stick uh, some saline in one and they stick a camera and the other and they stick their surgical tools in a third. So rather than having to make a large incision and leave you with a large scar, they just make several small incisions. They can go in, they can see what they need to do with the camera and it's usually a faster recovery time and less damaging. A bunionectomy would be a surgical procedure to remove a bunion, which is overgrowth of that bone at the joint of the big toe, the hallux. Um, if you have a fracture, you will need to let that bone heal. And so at the very least, you need some kind of external fixation. External fixation means to hold the bone in place with something externally. So a cast 
or even a splint would be a form of external fixation. Um, reduction is the process of resetting the bone, of, of lining it up straight. So a closed reduction is done without surgery. Good friend of mine, her 11 year old broke her arm a couple of weeks ago actually, and it happened to be a really bad break of both the radius and the ulna. And it was a displaced fracture, but it was a closed displaced fracture. So the skin didn't break, um, but the bones were not lined up properly. So when they took her to the ER and they did the x-ray and saw that, they needed to do a closed reduction, which essentially meant giving her some good painkillers and then like pulling on her arm to straighten, the, get the bones lined up. So closed reductions are really painful um, and they give you good pain meds, but I don't know that they're that good. Uh, it sounded like it was a really painful procedure and really traumatizing for my friend and her to see her daughter go through that. But she's fine now, she's totally fine, she's a trooper. Both, mom and daughter. All right, an open reduction and internal fixation would be surgery to have pins or plates put in to internally hold the bones together in place. So one of my friends in college, I have a lot of stories about people in this chapter, um, she was she's very accident prone. She's always getting in, in injuries. But in college, she was playing like frisbee or or touch football or something, and um, she collided with someone and they fell. And he fell on her foot and twisted it funny, and she broke her ankle. And the bones in the ankle, of course, are all very small, and so they get displaced. It's hard to position them correctly using a closed reduction. So she had to have surgery. She had to have an open reduction and internal fixation. So she had some some pins put in to hold the bones together. So this uh, procedure is usually called an ORIF for us. Uh, that's basically surgery to put bones in place with pins or plates. A cast as pictured here, a plaster cast is a form of external fixation. A prosthesis is something um, that might be used if somebody needs amputation. So if a bone is so badly damaged that it can't be fixed, it might, that whole limb or a part of the limb might need to be removed and that would be an amputation. And following an amputation, one might get a prosthesis, a, an artificial, um, device, an artificial replacement of a hand or an arm or a leg or what have you. So that's really the end of the lecture. This is a website that I like to tell people about. Um, it's called Anatomy Arcade and there's various games. I mean it's really for kids but the level of bones and muscles that you need to know in this class is pretty basic. So the two games in here, Whack a Bone and Poke a Muscle, are um, a little bit more fun way to practice the names of the bones and muscles rather than just running through flashcards or labeling a picture. Um, so there's probably a bunch of different apps as well that you could use to learn the names of the bones and muscles, but also can be a good website for kids if you have kids who are interested in learning a bit more about anatomy. So that's the end of chapter eight.